So we talked about our system of government really being divided into the federal versus the state, uh, its state counterpart. It shouldn't surprise everyone that we have uh, two different court systems. We have a federal court system um, that hears a small percentage of cases, and we have a much bigger state court system that handles a lot more cases. Um, and that's obvious by what the slide says. State courts resolve, and I love the statistics because they really tell the story. State courts resolve 95% of the lawsuits brought in this country. That's huge. So we're gonna spend all this time talking about the federal court system that only hears 5% of the cases, but the importance is the federal court system has very broad authority to decide questions relating to federal law and so on, so we obviously have to understand uh, that system much better uh, as well. So let's first focus on the state court system, and forgive me that I don't use the board a lot because I think the way that the slides are set up kind of tells the story that I need to tell. And before I go through some of these early slides, I just wanna give you a diagram because I think, at least I do, I learn a lot better by first seeing something visually and then taking in the words. So let me just go ahead a few slides because I know there's a slide that I wanted to show. All right, I know this looks like a messy slide, but focus for a minute with me on this slide. And forget about these lighter colors for a minute and look at one, two, three. Look at the three-step process. One, two, three. So if you had to look at or describe either the state or the federal court system, think of it being a three-step process, okay? Starting at the bottom, and we'll come back to what this is. Starting at the bottom, every, not every, 99% of the cases start here at the trial court level. At, you know, when, when we think about watching a court case, right? When we watch TV, right? And we turn on the TV and we look at a trial. What we're really watching is a case that's here, right? When we have, you know, the plaintiff, the defendant, and we'll understand this terminology more when we talk about procedure in the next, you know, and we have lawyers getting up and making statements, we have a jury, we have a judge, you know, we have witnesses, we have testimony being taken. All of that happens at a trial court, okay? That's the first level. And then, as we'll see in a minute, if the case is decided and one party wants to appeal it, they go to the next level, and that is referred to as a intermediate level or state appeals court. And if there's still dissatisfaction and you want to go another step, you go to the state Supreme Court, right? One, two, three. And at the state level, you'll see that it is possible, although, you know, at some point parties can't go much further than this, you could potentially take that case by appealing it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, okay? But really what we need to understand is that Appeals courts, unlike trial courts, do not work in the same way. In that, appeals courts are not going to rehear everything. They're not gonna hold a trial again. They're not gonna take testimony again. They're not gonna look at evidence again. They are very different. In the sense that you will only have a panel of judges, not just one judge, but a panel of judges who will listen to the lawyers through their briefs about what they're arguing went wrong at the trial court level and whether or not the case should be reversed, overturned, stay the way it is, or be sent back for further hearings, okay? So it doesn't work the same way as, you know, because for example, the Supreme Court doesn't, you know, it basically hears from the lawyers and asks questions. That's how appellate courts work, right? So. Really, this is where a lot of the action is. It's at the trial court level, and it's where we think about what we think about what most courts are doing, which is holding a trial, right? So keep this picture in mind, and understand that cases start here at this level, at the trial court level. And while we're on this picture, let's just talk for a minute, because that's what the first slide is, is let's say at the state trial court level, 
uh, you know, pick the state of New Jersey, right? This is where we are. We're in Newark, and there are a bunch of courthouses like right, right down the block, uh, and so on. So general courts mean they can hear any type of case, right? If I have a contract dispute with another party, I may start a lawsuit right there in the New Jersey general trial court level. If someone is suing someone else for breach of contract, they'll go there. If someone is suing someone over a real estate dispute, they'll go there, right? That's general jurisdiction, meaning general matters can be heard by that court. But, you know, every state sort of sets up some, what they refer to as limited jurisdiction or special courts. And examples of them are here. Um, and by the way, we should just sort of look at this a little bit closer. General jurisdiction could mean civil or criminal, and we'll talk about the differences. Criminal is a crime. Civil are monetary damages, typically. So there are those two divisions. But other than that, you'll have courts like small claims court. Everyone know what a small claim court is? If you watch TV, you know those silly shows that are on that are that's an example of a small claims court because what they're you're really talking about there is not a lot of procedure, doesn't cost a lot of money, but what you're suing for is a small amount of money, $5,000, maybe $10,000 maximum, right? Don't even need a lawyer, you can do your own thing, very little procedure. Municipal courts, you know, if you've ever had a traffic ticket, I'm sure everyone here drives under the speed limit or whatever, never ever had a traffic ticket, but let me tell you, they're out there. And if you're ever going to fight one of those tickets, you might find yourself in one of these municipal courts with you know, their traffic court division. Justice of the peace courts, right? you know, uh, small issues. Uh, juvenile division, could be serious issues. Domestic relations division, a lot of family law courts. Probate, does anyone know what the word probate means? Probate division. Wills, trust, you know, upon someone's death in order to get a will. Um, uh, executed and kind of go through the process. So the point here is that states will basically decide everything and they'll put them either in the civil or criminal, but for some very sort of specific matters such as wills and trust, juvenile, family law, small claims, municipal, they will have courts of limited jurisdiction. So with that picture in mind, let's go back to the beginning. So there are two different court systems, federal and state. We've already been through that. So this is where I want to start off. The limited jurisdiction trial court. They hear matters of specialized or limited nature, right? So if I ask you, for example, to say, could be a probate court, could be family law, it could be juvenile division, it could be, you know, those types of very, very specific things. And they work just like any other trial court. You can introduce evidence testimony can be taken, and by the way, if you want to appeal a decision, you can go further up. You can go up to the trial court, you can go up to an appellate court. And for example, small claims is another type of a limited jurisdiction court, not criminal cases, civil cases involving very small dollar amounts. I mean, it could be $5,000, $10,000, but in the scheme of things, that's pretty small. Now, this is where we sort of get to that first, first level, right? General jurisdiction trial courts. Here are cases that are not within the jurisdiction of limited jurisdiction. So, you know, if it's not a traffic matter, if it's not a probate matter, if it's not a family law issue, if it's anything else, this court has what we refer to as jurisdiction, meaning the authority to hear that type of a case. So what do these courts do? Well, these courts do exactly what we think a court should be doing. They record and store testimony. They handle a trial, right? Um, and a lot of uh, states basically divide up their courts, uh, general jurisdiction courts based on criminal versus civil parts. Because again, the subject matter can be so very uh, different. And the trial court's gonna have a decision. Some of those decisions are made by the judge, other decisions are made by a jury, but you can bet that one party may be happy and another party may be unhappy with that decision. Um, so it is possible to have a decision be appealed, meaning reviewed again 
by the next level, and we'll see, if you picture the diagram again, there is an intermediate or a middle level appellate court, and if you're not satisfied there, you can go up to the state Supreme Court, right? That's the three levels, trial court, intermediate appellate court, Supreme, you know, the state level, Supreme Court level. So at the intermediate appellate court, meaning in between, um, you hear appeals from the trial court. And what do they do? Well, they review the record. They're not gonna hold the trial again. If they take the case, they're going to look to see, was there an error, right? We're not, you know, just because courts have all this authority doesn't mean that they are, they never make a mistake. Doesn't mean that they either took in evidence that they shouldn't have or they applied the wrong law or there wasn't something that should have been done differently, right? So that's what the appellate court is going to look at. It's usually a panel of judges, not just one judge, there's no jury, it doesn't work that way. And they're going to look to see, do they have to reverse the decision? Do they need to modify uh, that decision? They're not gonna take any new testimony. They're not gonna take any new evidence. I say that, but then I wanna sort of say, well, that's true, except if they think that you needed to take more testimony, you needed to take more evidence, they will send it back to the trial court. They're not gonna do it, but if they, there's been an error, they can modify and send it back to the trial court level, or they can just reverse and say, no, this, you know, you should, the court had no authority, this was a not invalid search or seizure, you couldn't, you couldn't take in that as a testimony, as a result, the conviction should be overturned, right? That's their job. Um, if one of the parties is still dissatisfied by the intermediate appellate court decision, it is possible for the decision to be appealed. And remember, appellate court doesn't have to take it. They may decide to take uh, uh, a case. You know, again, we live in a society that many would argue is highly litigious, meaning we sue each other a lot. Uh, and you know, I, I mean, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek because. If you look at other systems, you know, our European counterparts, are, for example, the book had a great uh, discussion at the very end of this chapter on the Japanese system. Did anyone read it? Well, from now on, I want to see everyone say, of course I've read it. Uh, but this is the first class where I'm still getting, but yeah, I mean, the Japanese system works totally differently. I mean, they have a fraction of the number of lawyers that we have. They have a fraction of the number of cases that are litigated. It just isn't done that way. And I'm not passing judgment on what's right or what's wrong. I'm just telling you the reality. Uh, as countries go, we sue each other an awful lot. Uh, and, you know, and we'll, we'll see other statistics about how a lot of cases are actually even settled before they go to trial. But it's just the way, you know, we don't work by compromise as much. We work by butting heads a little bit more. Um, and that's just the way it is. Uh, but the point here is that it is a very saturated system, right? It is not possible for every case to be taken for appeal. I mean, otherwise we would, you know, have a court on every block. It just isn't possible. So again, yes, in theory it's possible to appeal, 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 but you know, you have to see, the courts have to make a decision on whether or not a case really raises the kinds of issues that need to be reviewed on appeal. And parties need to decide how they need to spend their resources. You know, oftentimes you'll find parties, and this is where the practical experience comes in, where it becomes personal. It becomes an ideological thing. It's not even about, you know, it's about getting the other side. And you have to say to yourself, if what you're fighting over is $50,000, and if what you're gonna spend on litigation is $150,000 and resources and everything else, is it a good business decision to pursue that case or not, right? So there's a lot that sort of has to be thought through and we'll think about all of that. But the point here is that yes, in theory you can appeal, appeal, but in reality, it may not be something that is wise to do. And yes, every state has a, their highest state court, that's the third level. Some states call it a Supreme Court, some states call it a Superior Court, you can call it whatever, but it is the top tier court, and it hears appeals from the intermediate appellate courts. They also do not hear new testimony or evidence, and once they make a decision, 
It really is final at the state level, except that it is theoretically possible to now move to the federal level and go all the way up to the Supreme Court, or at least file a petition for appeal. And we'll see a startling statistic about how many cases the Supreme Court actually takes. We've done this already. You can memorize it. You can take the slide. Um, you know, when you go to sleep tonight, so you can ingrain it into your memory, however you want to do it, but I think the visual tells a very good story. All right, the good news of the federal court system is that it kind of mirrors the state court system, except for the fact that the names of the courts are a little different. It is also a three-level system that starts off at, you know, we call the trial court a different name, but then there's an intermediate Appellate, federal appellate court, we call it by a name, uh, and then there is a state, uh, the federal Supreme Court. But we also start off with the federal court system by saying that, look, just like states have limited jurisdiction courts, the federal courts also have limited jurisdiction courts, but they're different. They're different because we'll see that the states and the federal courts are looking at different types of cases. For, for example, bankruptcy. You know, we'll cover bankruptcy in business law too. For those of you that go on to take business law too, you'll see that bankruptcy is purely federal law. So you can't file bankruptcy in the state of Wyoming. You have to file bankruptcy at the, fed, you know, the federal court level. So bankruptcy courts just do bankruptcy. They're at the federal level. They're limited jurisdiction because that's all they do, right? Um, and other kinds of cases, tax courts, federal claims courts, veterans affairs, so on and so forth, they only handle those things. They're fairly specialized. It doesn't make sense to throw those cases into the general uh, court system. So we just have sort of limited jurisdiction courts. But beyond that, you come back to you know, the general jurisdiction uh, federal court. So if we're going to start off at the bottom, right, the first tier, the trial courts at the federal level are called US district. Yes, you have to know that, I'm sorry. You have to know what they're all, right? So every state has at least one district court, federal district court within their you know, state's borders. If you will. But that's a federal court. Federal court will apply either federal law or state law. They're, you know, they're two different court systems, if you will. So if you are in a, and we'll see why some cases go to federal court and why some cases go to state court, but if you're at the federal um, level, you are going to file a complaint in, at the trial court level at the US district court level. And they will do exactly what a trial court does. They will have a jury, they will take in evidence, they will hear testimony, they will decide the case. When I say they, again, could be a judge, could be a jury, uh, either way, but that's their job, right? Um, and because, you know, and the book had a nice map of showing, you know, states that are heavily populated, New York, New Jersey, anything on the East Coast basically, will have several district courts, whereas states that are less populated, you know, go to I don't know, South Dakota, not, you know, I mean, just areas geographically that are, will have fewer district courts. But by, you know, under the Constitution, you're supposed to have at least one district court in every United States, uh, in every state in the United States, okay? So that's sort of, again, at the federal level, U.S. district courts are the trial courts that basically will hear testimony and decide cases. If a party is not happy, with the decision they get at the trial court level, where are they gonna go? They're gonna appeal the case, and they're going to go to the intermediate level federal court. We have to know the name. What are the intermediate level federal courts called at the federal level? They are called, highlighted, the US Court of Appeals. And this is where like, people look at me and say, well, you're torturing you with information. That's the thing about this course lots and lots of information to understand and retain, okay? Are, is there more than one appellate court, a U.S. Court of Appeals? Yes, there are circuits. So if you look at your book, for example, and you don't have to memorize this, I'm just trying to give you an appreciation. 
that if you look at a map of the United States, that geographically carve out different circuits. And they will say, all right, the state of New Jersey and of Pennsylvania, and I think Delaware is in the third circuit, New York, along with a few other states is in the second circuit. You know, they're gonna group them together and there are 13 circuits. And you know, if you have a case decided in New Jersey at the US District Court right here in Newark, and you're the plaintiff and you lost the case, where are you gonna appeal? You're going to appeal at the third circuit level of the US Court of Appeals. You don't have to remember the numbers, I'm just saying that you go to the Court of Appeals. The US Court of Appeals is the second level at the federal court level. You're getting confused looks. Are we retaining or are we confused? All right, give it a minute to kind of just sort of understand that, you know, circuits are just, you know, you're not gonna have 50 different courts of appeal. We're gonna have fewer. So we're just going to, there are 50 states, then three or four states are going to fall into one circuit. That's all it is, okay? Uh, and essentially what's going to happen is that when you appeal, from the trial court at the federal level, when you appeal a decision from the U.S. District Court, you go up to the U.S. Court of Appeal in the circuit that you happen to be in. And they're gonna do exactly what we expect an appellate court to do. They're going to look at the lower court's record. Um, they're going to decide if there was an error made by the parties by the judge, by the jury, whatever the case might be, and then to see whether or not it warrants a reversal or a modification. And by the way, again, it's not a judge at the appellate court level, it is a panel of judges, and this is more procedure that you need to know for our purposes, but technically, when you first appeal, three judges look at the case, and again, they look to decide, and if you're not happy with their decision, you get to go back and request what is called an en banc review. En banc means I want the full bench to look at it. And you know, that could be, you know, I, you know you're, you're appealing again. Again, this costs time, money. A lot of constitutional big issues do go through this process. But if I have a $50,000 dispute with somebody, you know, this is going to cost more money, more headache, more in lawyers' fees than you could ever imagine. But what if it's a death penalty case? All of a sudden, stay, you know, so you get an appreciation for the types of cases that are appealed. They're typically not, you know, until, unless you're talking about a multi million dollar decision in some intellectual property case where Microsoft is involved or Apple is involved. Yeah, you might go through all of this because you're talking about huge dollar amounts. But you know, if I have a dispute with my neighbor, I'm not doing all this. This is, this is ridiculous. This is, you know, once I get a decision at the trial court, I'm probably going to live with it. You know, but you need to understand the procedure um, that is involved. And I would say that this is probably more detailed than you need to know for our purposes. But understand that at the, you know, that a case gets appealed. It goes from the district court to the U.S. Court of Appeals. To look at it to decide whether or not they need to modify, change, or do anything, and from there on, what's the last thing, the last place it can go? The Supreme Court at the federal level is just one, and it's the United States Supreme Court. You know, every now and then you hear commentary by somebody that says, well, you know, when, when, when the country was young, we had one Supreme Court. Now the U.S. population is you know, 350 million people, look at what's, why do we still have just one U.S. Supreme Court? You know, if, why can't we have more than one? And there are pros and cons, but that argument is going nowhere. Uh, essentially, whether it's tradition or whether whatever it is, uh, or whether it's the headaches that we already have, we only have one Supreme Court, which gets appeals from the federal system, the state system, and by the way, did anyone read the statistic in the textbook? How many cases are appealed to the United States Supreme Court every year? Say it out loud. Anyone remember? 100,000 cases are appealed. How many cases do they actually typically hear? Take a guess. Remember, there are only nine of them. They only have short terms. 100. So, you know, so the joke is, well, we'll take you all the way to the Supreme 
report? Sure, in theory you can, and our system is set up that way, but the reality is that only very select cases of grave importance actually make their way up to the Supreme Court. And the judges and justices of the Supreme Court have a say in the types of cases that they actually take. So yeah, they hear appeals from everywhere. They go from the state courts, from federal courts, from district courts, from, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, it's 100,000 cases coming at them, and they're gonna be very picky on the ones that they actually do take. And yeah, they're appeals court. They don't take any new evidence. They don't hear any new testimony. They look at the record, and they have the briefs and the lawyers in front of them, and they will take that all in, and they will render a decision that will become precedence because it's a Supreme Court decision, and it's gonna carry a lot of authority. And yes, no, no surprise, the Supreme Court's decision is final, unless, for example, the legislature changes something. Right, it is possible that that could happen, but we've seen the current climate of our government, and I, you know, have to wonder if yes, it's possible in theory, but it is, you know, it's just the way our government works. It's very sort of checks and balances oriented. All right, more sort of general information. The Supreme Court of the United States has nine justices. How do you get on the Supreme Court? Well, you have to be a judge of extreme um, um, uh, caliber and you know, not just education, but experience. Oftentimes, you've already served on um, the federal system or you know, you're part of um, the, you know, the federal administrative agencies or whatever the case might be, but ultimately, you are selected um, to be appointed by the president if there is a vacancy during the president's term. And again, checks and balances, not just the executive branch, the confirmation has to come from the Senate. And we've seen some drama over the years, haven't we? Uh, why is this such a big deal? It's a big deal because it's a lifetime position. And the idea is that you are above the politics and once you're on, you're on, you know? And you will shape, um, you know, societal norms, you will shape precedents for years to come, it's a big deal, right? So one justice is the chief justice of the Supreme Court and the other eight are considered associate justices, obviously we know that. Um, yes, the Supreme Court is an appellate court, meaning it only hears appeals. Um, it reviews the records of lower courts, as we've said, to determine whether or not a case should be decided or should have been decided differently. So if there are nine people, that's an odd number, right? And it's designed to be an odd number. Um, you could have a unanimous decision of the United States Supreme Court where all nine justices are on the same page. It's possible. It hasn't been the case lately, uh, but it is possible. Um, Brown versus Board of Education, the case we just talked about was a unanimous decision. Um, but just because the court decided a case unanimously or through what's called a majority decision doesn't mean that it's any less effective, right? Even a majority decision is something like 9-0, I'm sorry, 8-1, 7-2, 6-3, 5-4, right? Majority takes the day. That, you know, even though four justices fought hard, they didn't carry that day. That will be the precedent going forward. What's a plurality decision? Where you get at least you know, five or six or seven judges saying, yes, that is a decision, but their reasoning is different. You know, you, you, know, you could have, for example, using just the healthcare law as an example, five justices did decide to uphold that law, but you know, the chief justice came down under one part of the Constitution, whereas a couple of others would have come down under another part of the Constitution. The reasoning was different. And they will write their opinions, and their opinions are so important. You know, people pour over them to see what will happen in future cases that are just slightly different, right? So yeah, it makes a big deal. You know, a plurality decision is no different in terms of the consequences as a majority decision, but the court's reasoning is different. How could you have a tie if you have nine people? Isn't that mathematically impossible? But it does happen. What are the circumstances in which that can happen? Well, you 
uh, one of them to be sick or something. Sure, it's possible. Um, you know, the other one that's even a bigger one is a conflict of interest. You know, a justice might have to recuse themselves. You know, not be able to hear a case. For example, you know, Justice Kagan, who was appointed from within the Obama administration, um, you know, served in the administration. If a case comes before the Supreme Court that she actually had a hand in, you know, uh, having the policy reviewed or whatever, she has a conflict of interest. She would have to recuse herself. Or you could have a Supreme Court justice that you know maybe did business or heard a similar case while they were in private practice or whatever the case might be. Um, you know now you're left with a possibility of four justices being one way and four justices being another, and that is the worst thing you could hope for because that kind of a decision basically means that the lower court's decision stands. It's still relevant because you're looking at the court's reasoning on each side, but. Oh, you know, it literally was a tie, so you can't break that tie. You actually have to let the lower court on the decision stand in that case. It happens, but happens rarely. And the fancy way in which parties will ask for the Supreme Court to review their case once they appeal it is they will file what is called a petition for certiorari. A petition for cert is what they call it which is just basically the thousands of dollars it costs to put together the paperwork to have the Supreme Court even consider whether or not they want to hear the case. And by the way, I'm not joking, that's what it costs uh, uh, to appeal. I mean, the legal process is not just time consuming, it is expensive. Uh, and that's just the reality. I'm not passing judgment, it is just the reality. And you might say to yourself, well, how do these death penalty cases where the defendant is, doesn't have any money. Well, a lot of times, you know, those are pro bono cases where someone, some law firm is putting the bill for whatever their reasoning might be, but it is a time consuming and expensive process. And lo and behold, if the Supreme Court decides that you're one of the lucky hundred that they're actually gonna hear the case from, they will issue what is called a writ of certiorari. Petition for certiorari is asking the court to review. A writ is the court's decision, the official notice that the Supreme Court will take the case. Cases are decided where the justices will not only decide a case, they will write lengthy opinions, right? So you would have a majority Opinion. You could have a what's called a concurring opinion where an associate judge might say, well, you know what, I agree, but I, there are some other reasons why I agree. And here's you know, 30 pages of constitutional analysis of why we feel that way, or I feel that way. I've written usually with help from their you know, uh, law clerks and so on. But it's fascinating stuff, and it's interesting stuff, and it's the stuff that not just individuals, some businesses pay a lot of attention to because they want to see, you know, if it's a case deciding intellectual property, or you know, you're actually looking to see what is the court thinking, what is the concurring opinion talking about, what could a you know another federal court latch onto in the next case. So this is very, very significant for for, for a lot of people. And by the way, so are dissenting opinions. Just because a justice happened to be in the four, like if it's a 5-4 decision, they are writing impassioned dissents about why they do not agree with that decision. It may not carry the day today, but think about it. If the composition of the Supreme Court changes tomorrow, five years from now, and you get a justice on the Supreme Court that agrees with the dissent, the next case that goes up to the Supreme Court could be a 5-4 decision, the other one. So really interesting in terms of how legal precedent is formed, really. It comes down to human beings and their beliefs and their way that they're applying the same constitution but how they're interpreting it. And that's fascinating. And another way of thinking about the law not being exactly black or white but being quite gray. Okay. So the question that should be on all your minds if you weren't so tired from taking in all this information would be, well, how do, you, how do I decide what case goes to the federal court system and what case goes to the state court system? I know I said at the beginning that 95% of the cases are decided at the state court level, 
then what are, you know, I mean, how do you make that, how do, you, how do parties decide where to file? If I have a dispute, how do I know which courthouse I should go uh, file a petition uh, you know, or a complaint under? Well, jurisdiction, meaning does a court have the authority to hear a case actually determines that. And federal courts have only so much jurisdiction. And part of their jurisdiction is that they will hear exclusively any case that arises out of the United States Constitution, a treaty, a federal law, or federal regulation. Because again, think about it, it wouldn't make sense. You know, if, if, if a party is challenging something as being unconstitutional under the United States Constitution, and they go to the New Jersey State Court, how does that make any sense, right? So regardless of the dollar amount at issue, and even if the party's looking for a dollar amount, if all they're looking for is to call a law unconstitutional, you're gonna have to go through the federal court system, and you will start at the US District Court level. Okay, so those cases, by definition, have to go to the federal court system. And the other one that you should really memorize, and by the way, when I stress things, it's because they're important. Um, it's because it could be exam material, and more importantly for your case, it could be CPA exam material. I mean, everything is important, but when I say diversity of citizenship, that's huge, because it's the other basis by which federal courts get their jurisdiction. Diversity, different. Citizenship, not citizenship as in foreign country, but citizenship meaning state citizenship. So diversity of citizenship basically means citizens of different states. And when I say citizen, I don't just mean you and I as individuals, I also mean businesses, right? So where a corporation is incorporated, where a corporation has its principal office of business, where a corporation does business, all of those could make it, you know, could affect jurisdiction for that quote unquote citizen, right? And if it's a foreign country, well the rules sort of vary a little bit, but here, let's just forget about foreign country for a minute. The fact of the matter is that if I here sitting in New Jersey want to sue Google, and now that came into my mind, um, you know, I'm not limited to New Jersey. I can go to federal court if, if the matter that I'm suing for involves a uh, amount over $75,000. And it used to be $50,000 up until a few years ago, now it's $75,000. Is that a lot of money? It is to you and I. Uh, but in the scheme of things that we're talking about, if someone is going to go use a court system, and they're suing for $75,000, it's not a lot of money. It just isn't, because the litigation costs far exceed that in a heartbeat, right? So it is very possible that when you have uh, citizens of two different states that you can go to the federal court system because the dollar amount is not a lot. It's just not a lot, you know. Yes, you know, when, you're, when, when you have a contract dispute over $15,000, forget it. But if you've got, you know, a dispute where you're talking about a good amount of money, it is possible that you will have diversity of citizenship and the ability to go to federal courts. You don't have to, but you do have the ability to do it. So again, federal courts will hear federal laws, federal crimes, antitrust law, bankruptcy, patents, lawsuits against the United States, well these are all based on federal law. States have no business deciding these types of cases. That's clear. Exclusive jurisdiction, meaning can't go to state courts. Ah, okay, admiralty courts, yes, we know all that. All right. Uh, what about state courts? What do they have jurisdiction? Well, remember we said that the way the Constitution is set up is whatever uh, the federal government doesn't have authority to do, the states have authority to do, that's sort of the mindset of the Constitution, is that sort of the mindset of the court system as well. The states have the ability to hear every other case that the federal government doesn't have jurisdiction over. So if it's not federal law, if it's not involving the Constitution, not diversity of everything else, 
So that's, now you understand why 95% of the cases get resolved at the state court level. I mean, you think about litigation, that's most everything else, right? But it is possible that, you know, at the same time, two parties that are in dispute with one another have a choice to either go to federal court or state court, and that's referred to as concurrent jurisdiction because concurrent means at the same time, right? So that's, for example, diversity of citizenship. I live in New Jersey, I want to sue Google, I could go to California um, and sue at federal court, or I could file suit in New Jersey because I'm a New Jersey resident. I have a choice. And guess what? I could file suit in New Jersey, but big Goliath Google will say, I'm removing this to California, and they probably will, because they have a choice. Uh, that's what diversity of citizenship allows you to do. Um, and again, you might say, why? Why would someone care? Isn't a court a court? Isn't a trial court a Well, remember, for example, precedent? It could be a strategy. It could be that precedent is more favorable at the federal level than at the state court level for the issue that's at dispute. So oftentimes, where you bring a lawsuit, even though you have a choice of federal versus state, part of it could be based on where the better precedent is or where you think this issue could be better resolved, or just ease of the part, whatever the case might be, oftentimes parties have a choice, yes. But don't the uh, lower courts have to follow the precedent set by the higher courts anyway? Excellent question. Don't lower courts have to follow? Well, remember, lower courts in which system? Does a state, does a federal court have to follow precedents at the state level? No, they don't. They can look at it as an influencing uh, sort of a thing, but they don't. And oftentimes you go to federal courts because you know I, there could be a New Jersey state court decision that is very unfavorable uh, on that particular contractual dispute issue, which is the very reason I want to remove it to the federal court because the federal court is not bound by that person. So you have to look at precedent a little bit more carefully. Yeah, but you're absolutely right and that's a very good question. Uh, and there might be some federal questions over which federal courts do not have exclusive jurisdiction. So you might have some environmental issue or something like that where it's possible that either federal or state courts, and again, parties will decide where they want it heard. Um, but there are many reasons why you would want it state versus federal and parties have to make that decision. But the question is, you know, if it's exclusive federal law, it has to go to federal court. If it's not, then you have a choice between state or federal courts, and it may be that one party, the plaintiff brings it in a state court or a federal court, and the other side decides that they want to remove it, um, and that's possible too. So there's a lot of procedure involved. And when I say litigation is complicated and time-consuming and expensive, before you even get to hear the merits of a case, you're spending thousands of dollars on jurisdiction. So you know, bear that in mind. And you know, we'll talk a lot about how businesses are moving towards what are alternative dispute resolutions, negotiation, arbitration, things like that, because the court system has a lot of procedure. Uh, the defendant decides which court hears a concurrent ju jurisdiction stand in that uh, case, and that is just a procedural point, a lot of detail for our knowledge base for now, but just to understand the importance of jurisdiction. Okay. A couple of other concepts, and I promise we will uh, uh, stop for the day. Standing. The word standing. We know what the word standing is. I'm doing it right now. But the word standing has legal meaning. Standing means whether or not an individual plaintiff has the ability to bring a lawsuit in the first place. And essentially, under the law, plaintiff must have a stake in the outcome. Meaning you have to have an interest, a personal interest, not just you know, a real interest. For example, the book gave an example. You know, let's say you know, I'm friends with somebody. And you know, I just saw that my friend has been wronged by another party. You were taken advantage of you know, by, by, by a business. And you're just a nice guy. And you're just like, you know what? It doesn't matter. You know, karma resolves everything. I'm not suing. I'm just going to go live my own. And you know, I'm just a very litigious person. I say, this is horrible. How dare you not bring a lawsuit? I'll do it on your behalf. Do I have standing? Do I have a personal outcome in the case? 
Oh, but we're still staking the outcome, sorry. No, you know. So in order to bring a lawsuit, a plaintiff has to have legal standing, the legal authority to even bring that lawsuit. And that's usually the case, but you could think about some kind of silly examples where I want to do it on behalf of somebody is not going to work. And you know, a lot of cases at, you know, at the federal level are sort of being decided, well, we hate this law, even though it doesn't apply to us, we just think it's unconstitutional. The courts will say you have no standing. You know, you know, and there are a lot of sort of government naysayers out there that bring a lot of cases that are rejected on standing grounds. Okay. Now I could stand here for the better part of the afternoon and go into in personam jurisdiction for you, and you would find it extremely boring. Um, and you know, maybe some of you find it interesting. Uh, I want to cover this, but I want to cover it in enough detail so you understand it, but I don't want to think we need to cover it in as much detail as it is presented, because here's what you need to understand. The courts need to have you know, personal sort of authority over the parties that come before it. And that's sort of what's known as in persona or in person jurisdiction. Um, and you know, the plaintiff who files a lawsuit obviously has surrendered their jurisdiction to the court. If I'm going to tap on your door and say, here my dispute, I'm giving you, the court, authority to have jurisdiction. Now the question becomes, does the court have jurisdiction, that particular court have jurisdiction over the person of the defendant, right? So the courts have to resolve these kinds of issues first. So this is sort of a cute little case. Chanel, right? We ladies know about Chanel. Um, so Chanel is suing a businesswoman in China, uh, in the southern district of Florida. Um, and the question is, and you know, uh, uh, the facts of the case are pretty simple. Um, the businesswoman is basically using all kinds of um, uh, names uh, to kind of confuse Chanel. So she will have clothing and handbags that she's selling under names like Chanel for you or Chanel Rocks or whatever. And basically, this is sort of saying, hey, this is infringement. This isn't, you know, Chanel has crafted a brand recognition and sort of this notion of very high-end whatever. They don't want someone else using their name so it can be confused with the real, the French Chanel, right? So, but they want to go after uh, this plaintiff and they can't find her. They can't, they can't even serve her. Um, and the way that they figure out uh, to do it is using an email address. Uh, because apparently this person is using all kinds of faulty and misleading addresses and so on. So the court has to decide, can a court grant plaintiff Chanel the authority to serve the defendant by email? This is what I mean about technology in the digital age kind of having to keep up with, and what does the court say? Sure, no problem. You know, she is doing her business online. She, she's got, you know, probably people working for her. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, the, the thing about, you know, when you think somebody's been sued, you know, you have to sort of knock on their door, you have to serve legal process, blah, blah, blah. Of course, they're going to start to, you know, look at this a little bit more loosely, given the age that we live in. Yes, it is possible to get uh, service uh, by email in the right set of circumstances. I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but for this kind of a slick, person that's sort of doing this, the court says yes. All right, so services process is just how do I know I've been sued? I've been sued when I can't serve a complaint, right? Uh, summons being served on a defendant to obtain jurisdiction over that person. Now, remember, the plaintiff has already surrendered their jurisdiction. They're filing a lawsuit in that court. How is a court going to get jurisdiction over a defendant? Well, if the defendant is in the same state, no problem, right? If I'm suing someone in the state, you know, if I just had a bad meal at a restaurant and I'm suing the restaurant and they're located right here, no problem, right? And what about, you know, the business? Where are they incorporated? Where are they doing business? All of these things will surrender jurisdiction in a particular state where, you know, where they have the principal offices and so on. Over time, courts are finding it very easy. Because remember, remember the world that we live in today. We travel very quickly. 
We do business across state lines. We have, uh, you know, we don't have to have a brick and mortar type of a building just because we're selling our products in all 50 states. Typically, that's why jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction is not that all important because court's going to say, that's it. By surrendering yourself in the state of Washington, by selling your cookies there, you can be sued in the state of Washington. You can't say, well, but I don't have an office there. I never go there. Doesn't matter. You sell cookies there, all right. You, you know, you can be sued there. So it's just becoming easier and easier for courts to have jurisdiction over parties. Which is why we want to talk so much about these concepts of long arm statute and the notion of having some minimum contact with the state because again, in 2015, if you're running a business, you're everywhere. You know, it's very rare. I mean, I would have to be someone who just makes jewelry and just goes to shows in New Jersey, uh, you know, to argue that no, you can't sue me anywhere else. I mean, most of the time, I'm out there. My name is out there. My internet, my website is. It runs in all 50 states. People are buying from me. I have minimum contacts such that I probably can be sued every, anywhere. Again, remember, diversity of citizenship matter over $75,000 and so on. But the whole point of this chapter is about can any court have jurisdiction over you? Typically, yes, because it's getting easier and easier. And again, I'm not going to worry too much about the facts of the case. I'll just do it for you. But starting next time, I'd like people to be well-versed so we can have more for discussion. So this was a case where an employee went rogue. Uh, this was a case where it was a Canadian employee, I think, working for a Connecticut-based company. And uh, what happened was the employee got wind that they were going to be terminated. So they tapped into the server of their employer from Canada in um, Connecticut, which is where it was housed, and they actually may have allegedly downloaded some confidential and privileged information just before they got their whatever so they could potentially you know, harm their reputation or use that information for their own benefit. That's not really the point of the case. The point of the case was when the Connecticut company wants to sue this employee, the Canadian employee says, well, you can't sue me in Connecticut. I live in Canada. Good luck. Uh, and the court says, yes, they can. And the reason is the fact that you tapped into the server, and that part is clear. You know, you, there are electronic records that show it, gives the Connecticut court jurisdiction over you, the defendant, in, uh, all the way to Toronto. Um, so again, it's just showing how easy, easier it's becoming to get jurisdiction over an individual or, or a business owner. So that's what this case was really about. So now to spend too much time on jurisdiction, I'm going to move on to another important word that you should know. Venue. Venue. And venue just means, look, you know, just because we know whether it's going to be a state court that's going to hear the case, the question is what state court, right? Because I could be here in Newark, um, wanting to sue a restaurant in Burlington County, South Jersey, right? Which court is going to hear? Is it going to be the Burlington County uh, courthouse or is it going to be the Newark County courthouse? The court here says is which particular court has venue depends on where the incident occurred or where the parties live. So it gives a little bit of, um, you know, the, where the parties live is geographically not going to match up. Then you look to see, well, when, where did this happen? Well, I ate a bad meal at the restaurant in Newark, but it turns out that the business is actually, uh, you know, the corporate offices are actually in Burlington County. Which courthouse do you think has venue? Newark, because that's where the incident happened. But you know where we see venue a lot? Change of venue um, kind of uh, disputes happening a lot if, if you watch the news and stuff. Are sens sensational cases, you know, because normally it doesn't matter so much, but oftentimes you'll find, you know, and there were these are sort of the sordid, detail, you know, kind of horrific cases where there's been a horrendous crime, and the defendant is going to argue that through their lawyers uh, that they can't get a fair trial. Remember Scott Peterson, way back when? Um, this was the horrific case of a husband that may have killed his wife with an unborn child. Blah blah blah. Um, and this was a case, like, I think it was Northern California, 
And you know, this case was like plastered all over CNN and all the cable news. So it was like, you know, and, and, and local news covered it ridiculously because it was just such a sad case. And Scott Peterson argued, I cannot get a fair trial here in whatever county it was. I want this case moved to you know, 100 miles away. You know, and the courts may consider that kind of a request and they might say, well, look, to get a jury that hasn't already been tainted with so much information, it might be easier to do that in, you know, in a different county within the state and they might change venue based on that reason if someone argues. But usually venue is either where the parties live or where the incident occurred, just to say, well, there are, you know, there are 10 state trial court that can hear it within the state, which one is gonna hear it? We're gonna make it simple and we're gonna make it based on geography, okay? So that's all venue really means, which particular court in the particular state. Okay, we're getting to the end, I promise. Uh, two other important concepts, and they are important because we're gonna come back to them. Forum selection and choice of law. Okay, etch these into your memory. And the reason they're so important is we're gonna talk so much more about the fact that parties, reasonable parties don't wanna go to court anymore. They wanna kind of decide ahead of time how their law, how their dispute is going to be resolved before it even happens. So they're gonna write it into their contract, right? So you could come up with a dispute where, you know, there are parties that live in different states, they may even live in different countries, you know? And then you're gonna have this problem of, well, which court is gonna hear the case, and by the way, which law is gonna apply? Is it gonna be Canadian law? Is it gonna be US law? Is it, you know, and by the way, you, know, you asked me a question a little while ago about, don't you have to follow precedents? You do, but you know, the precedent in a business law case might be very different in Delaware than it might be in Idaho. And you, know, you may want Delaware uh, law to apply. So the question is, can you have, as private parties, Clauses are just paragraphs in a contract, right? Can you write in something? And the answer is absolutely yes. And this is where I think it's so important for business students and you know, accounting students and so on to understand what is a forum selection clause. It is a contract provision that designates a certain court to hear any dispute regarding that contract. So if I have a contract with someone and I write in, and there will be a clause that says, if we have a dispute, our dispute will be governed by New Jersey state courts. Doesn't matter if there's diversity of citizenship, I've already written it in, right? And if we agree in that contract, we've already resolved that procedural issue, so we don't have to deal with it, if in case we have uh, a dispute among us. And we can go even further. Not only are we gonna have, forum just means, you know, the place. Choice of law, we're gonna write in, we're gonna decide on, you know, what, jurisdiction's law is going to apply. If we're, if we're parties from different state, if I'm entering into a contract with someone from Italy, for example, and that happens today, right? Let's write in, you know, or we forget courts, we might even pick an arbitrator, and we might even pick in which country's law will apply before we even execute our contract, and that's smart. That's really smart, and that's the way we're avoiding a lot of litigation today, by doing choice of law, by doing forum selection, even before there is a dispute and building that in to the negotiation process. But then you're bound by it, right? But it's still very, very worthwhile to do, and these are things that you should keep in mind and really pay attention to because we will come back to it. And we'll quickly end with the Facebook case. And again, it's a very simple case because you had Facebook disabling the account of uh, someone who lived in Staten Island. And that individual is arguing you didn't have the authority to do it. Um, but besides that, the question is where can this court, uh, case be held? Does it have to be heard in New York, where is where the plaintiff would like it to be heard? Or does it have to be in California, where Facebook is incorporated or where it has principal businesses? And but Facebook is smart. Facebook, we all, let's admit it, um, are on it. And we all signed up way back when. And when we signed up, we basically said, we agree with the terms and conditions. And I'm sure no one opened up those terms and conditions. They were there. 
And one of those conditions, one of those conditions was a form selection clause that said any dispute between the user and Facebook will be decided in courts in California. And the question is, why didn't we read it? I, too bad, the court says. And that, that is true. Is it enforceable? Yes. Will it be enforceable for any of these types of things? You know, we're talking about the digital age and so on. Yes. And you know, the, the question here was, well, when you clicked on it, you had to go to a different web page or it opened up a different window. Is that enough? And the court says, no. That's the way. This is the way. We're not, we're not a paper-oriented society. And consumer beware. Because, yeah, now, if there was some sort of a, a clause in there that was horrible to one party, that's one thing. But the fact that Facebook has decided that all disputes will be decided in California, you, the user, should know it. And if you don't want, if you want to challenge them on it, they'll just say account denied and move on. You'll just have to go on Twitter or something. Uh, because you just can't do it, right? So, yeah, form selection clauses are absolutely valid and they're absolutely a good idea.